As we begin this morning, I would ask you to turn with me to, in your copy of the Word of God to Daniel chapter 2. And we left off last week with somewhat of a chaotic situation where King Nebuchadnezzar has a disturbing dream. And he demands that that dream would be interpreted. And as all of the wisest men that he has surrounds him, they cannot meet his request. And just before Daniel and his friends are set to be killed, as they are part of those wise men in, in the king's rage, uh, God grants mercy to Daniel by showing him the dream and its interpretation. So we left off with Daniel before the king, and Daniel has said, There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. And today, I'm happy to say that we will get into the dream and the interpretation of the dream this morning. So if you would stand with me as we all read the word of the Lord together. <coughs> Praise God. We're in Daniel chapter 2. The verses we will cover are 31 through 49, but I will direct your attention to verses 44 and 45 for our reading this morning. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. <coughs> Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand. And that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation, sure. Let's go to the Lord and ask him for help. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. And we ask, God, that as we listen to your word, Lord, that we would grow in our faith, that we would be strengthened in our walk. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that as we consider this narrative, that you would illuminate the page so that it would shed light on our own lives so that we may be closer to you. Lord, would you guard my heart, guard my mind, guard my thoughts, and keep me from error. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. This is my favorite thing to do. Is to stand before you guys and bring you the word of God. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. And I love you guys. Love you too, James. <laughs> Thanks, brother. So here we are. Five days after election night. And since then, actually, I would say for the last year or so, we've seen red, blue, elephants and donkeys, uh, back and forth, up and down. We've seen the vote totals rise. We've seen the vote totals drop. We've seen a lot of states. Uh, my, my kids have seen this, the United States map so much this week, they can tell you we're in Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia, North Carolina. They can tell you where all these states are because they know because they're yellow. Um, anyways, we're considering lawsuits. I mean, there's so many things that have happening that have been happening in the last five days. And, uh, yesterday, they declared our new president-elect. It's the most chaotic election season 
that I have ever been a part of. Uh, it's the most chaotic that I can remember or that I'm even aware of. But we come here on the Lord's Day. The first day of the week. And we ask ourselves, what on earth just happened? <laughs> I don't know about you, but the week that I've been having, I woke up this morning saying, God, what just happened? And my God is gracious uh, to comfort me uh, during this time. But King Nebuchadnezzar, he was just as puzzled after his dream. And I would say that he overreacted, maybe a little bit more than we did, most of us. Uh, in his rage, he decided to kill a lot of people. And uh, luckily, God came through and spared uh, the lives of those who would be killed because of his faithfulness to Daniel. But the Lord provides an answer for the king through Daniel. And that's what we will cover today. And I think that as we wake up puzzled, confused, and maybe some of us rejoicing, maybe some of us a little distraught, I pray that Daniel's answer to the king would be our answer this morning as well. In this, we will see our doctrine this morning. That the kings and kingdoms of the earth are subject to Christ and his kingdom. Amen. Such a timely word. The kings and kingdoms of the earth are subject to Christ and his kingdom. I've divided up this passage into three sections. First, we will look at the king's dream and its interpretation. Secondly, I want us to consider the stone that struck the image in the dream. And that stone that became a great mountain. And then third, I want to look at how Nebuchadnezzar recognizes the Lord in heaven. So here we go. Number one. Uh, again, we're going to be going through quite a, a large chunk of scripture. Um, but just follow along in your Bibles in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, I'm going to throw in a bunch of other scripture as well. Um, so get your notepads handy. Uh, for all of our members here, I've sent out the notes with those uh, scripture references attached, and you can see those. Verse 31, Daniel chapter 2. We're going to look at the king's dream and its, inter its interpretation. It reads, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was fine, was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron... The clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken into pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. We'll stop there for a second. In the king's dream is this massive image. This statue, this sculpture, if you will. It was an image that was, as described by Daniel here and as seen by the king, this sculpture, this, this image was mighty. It was strong and structurally sound. It also had exceeding brightness and it could be seen as far as the eye could see. It's also described as being frightening. So it gave off a sense of dominion, a sense of oppressive power. Notice uh, that as we look and we consider this image, 
the pattern of the materials as you go down. It goes from strong to more delicate. It goes from shiny to a little more dull. It goes from, from valuable to a little more replaceable. But then there's this stone. This stone that's not a part of this image. A stone that is carved out of a mountain, not by human hands. So it's some divine, supernatural stone. It wasn't a notable, strong, or precious metal. It wasn't fashioned by human hands like iron and clay often would be. We don't know the trajectory of the stone. We don't know the velocity of the stone and how fast it was going. But it was strong enough not only to disintegrate the materials of the image, but then it was strong enough to grow into a great mountain that filled the earth at the very location that the image stood after it was disintegrated. Now as you look at this, it might be a little easy for us to maybe generally interpret this dream. See, because we, we're aware of a lot of this imagery. We're aware of a lot of these metaphors. And we can look at this dream and we can say, oh, the king should have just called on me. I could have interpreted it for him. But something that we need to look back on is that Daniel, his companions, King Nebuchadnezzar, they weren't aware of Jesus Christ. They were aware of a Messiah coming. But they weren't aware of Jesus Christ. You see, these Jewish boys, they would have been good Jewish boys coming up in Jewish homes before they were taken to Babylon. And they would have been familiar with Deuteronomy 32.4. Deuter Deuteronomy 32.4 is the first instance that we get in Scripture where God is referred to as the rock. Deuteronomy 32.4 states, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. See this, again, being the earliest reference to God being the rock. To represent his steadfastness and his strength. These boys would have also been familiar with quotes from King David in the Psalms. Quotes like, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Also quotes like, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's very likely that they would have had the Isaiah scroll with them as he prophesied before them. And they would have seen words like, he will become a stone of offense, a rock of stumbling, and many shall stumble on it. They shall fall and be broken. I would think it's very likely that they would have referred to that after hearing about this dream. But they would have also recalled where Isaiah said, Behold, I am the one who has laid a, as a foundation, a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. You see, so the, I think Daniel and his friends knew where this is going. And they, they had an idea of the sense of the interpretation of this. But Daniel was interpreting dreams of the future. While when we look at this passage, we look back at history. Well, most of us look back at history. There are different ways to interpret this passage of scripture. Some of us might see this as future events that have yet to occur. Some of us may look at it as history. But before we get into that, let's look at the interpretation. Verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar. There is no mincing of words here. And even though Daniel refers to Nebuchadnezzar as the king of kings, he is sure to mention that that status comes from the God of heaven. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, sure, you are the king of kings. You rule over everything. But God has given you that title. It is God who has set you up. 
to be that king. And notice, notice something here, that this is unmistakably similar to the command given to man in Genesis chapter 1. Did you see that when, when we read through that? Did you say, I've seen this somewhere? That in Genesis 1, God tells Adam to fill the earth, to subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of, of, of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And likewise, Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that you have the power, the might, and the glory. And it's in your hand that God has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and you rule over them all. You know, I, I find that as an interesting correlation there. And, and, it's, and it's, it, it's, it's ironic that, 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 that what God has given Nebuchadnezzar is what God has always given man since the beginning. But where, where man tends to fall short is to continually incorporate man's ideas, man's opinions, man's thoughts into their ways of doing things. Not to mention here, what's even more ironic is the Garden of Eden. If you look at that passage where you see where it's located, there's four rivers in the vicinity of the Garden of Eden. It's, it's, it's in the, the, the realm of four rivers, and two of, those, two of those rivers is the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now, ancient Babylon, uh, this is post-flood and everything like that, so there's probably some geographical movements and stuff like that, but even ancient Babylon was in the vicinity of the Tigris and the Euphrates. But ancient Babylon, as we know it, with Nebuchadnezzar is considered to be one of the greatest ancient empires to ever exist. More directly with God himself giving the power, might, and glory to him, Daniel identifies the gold head as Nebuchadnezzar and his empire. We go on to verse 39. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things, and like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it. You shall, or just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. Now, here, here is where this passage becomes so fascinating. And I love this stuff. You know, you get into talking about the eschatology and things like that. But as we consider this, we ought to be intentional. And we ought to be careful not to overinterpret Daniel's interpretation. You see, because the, the dream has already been had and it's already been interpreted. Now, we have history that we can match up to the interpretation. But let's be careful that we don't put all of our thoughts and stuff into this historical interpretation here and not over interpret it but I think it's worth noting the following uh, Daniel was able to provide the course of action that God was going to take in the future he told the king this is what will happen in the latter days in the future and we today we know the who and the when so before I continue, let me make this disclaimer. There are various hermeneutical methods in which you can interpret eschatology and eschatological passages, such as the following. Um, what I will deliver is the most common understanding of this uh, passage. However, there are varying depictions of this understanding, and there's altogether different conclusions uh, that are outstanding. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is what I believe the Bible is, is teaching us. Uh, it corresponds with his, historical biblical teaching. Uh, it's in the Bible, and we can see it in history. So here we go. With Babylon as the golden head, we can look back at the progression of history to identify the succeeding kingdoms after Babylon, something that Daniel didn't know. Because three more separate and distinct kingdoms can be linked in accordance with this interpretation from Daniel. So we have number one, 
The head of gold is Babylon. Number two, the chest and the arms of silver. Right after the Babylonian Empire uh, came the overthrow, the overthrowing of the Persian Empire. I'm sorry, Persia overthrew Babylon. And that would have been the next major empire. So they would be the chest and arms of silver. And it actually combined with another nation to become the Medo-Persian Empire. And then number three, you have the middle and thighs of bronze. Now, the country and the kingdom that, that is known to have overthrown Persia was Greece. And you have Alexander the Great and his mighty conquest. They said he conquered the world. Uh, because his, his conquest was so great. Um, they ended up conquering Persia. And then we know by history that it was at the, with Julius Caesar at the helm that Rome ended up overtaking Greece. So number four, the legs of iron and feet mixed with clay would be Rome. And then Rome and its succeeding offshoots with its lasting influence in the world. So there you have it. Babylon is the head. The chest and arms, Medo-Persia. The middle and thighs, Greece. And then the legs of iron, Rome. The feet mixed with clay is the Roman kingdoms that were divided and all of its offshoots. Each successive kingdom becomes more secular and based on the efforts of men. You see, we see Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar, God has put you in this position as king of kings. He has given you this authority. And as you move down and you, and you consider Persia and everything that they did, and then you consider Greece and everything that they did, all the way down to Rome, you see how man has infiltrated what God has designed as far as men having dominion over the earth. And when you get down to Rome, there's pretty much no God whatsoever in their kingdom. One commentary said it like this, quote, the colossus of metal stands on weak feet. I like that. The colossus of metal stands on weak feet of clay. All man's glory is ephemeral and worthless as chaff. The world power in its heterogeneous constituents successively supplanting one another contains the element of decay. In other words, even though it portrays glory, even though this statue seems mighty, it is bound to fail. There is no way that this mighty image will continue forever. It is bound to fail. Verse 42. And as the toes of feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will be mixed with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. You see, this particular, it seems like the feet here become some sort of focal point in this image. We're talking about Rome, right? The iron, the legs of iron. We're talking about Rome here. Rome got to a point when it was divided into two sectors, the east and the west empires of Rome, hence the two legs. A strong historical case can be made that in the fifth century after Rome fell, that it was divided up into 10 kingdoms that the majority of the world can trace its history back to. Ten kingdoms, like ten toes, right? And in these ten kingdoms that was, that was noted here, well, we can see essentially the framework for what we have as nations today. I mean, we're talking kingdoms like France and Germany, Britain, and so on and so forth. Rome has had a major influence on the modern world. Rome still today has a major influence on the modern world. We can see its impact in our art, in our architecture, in technology, literature, language, and law. I mean, many of our terms in law are still in Latin, which was the language of Rome. 
Culture is littered with Roman influence from government to education to even a healthcare system. These all came from Rome. National Geographic was, I was, I was reading an, an article that was talking about Rome's influence on the modern world here, and much of the English, English language is from the Greco-Roman foundation, Greece and Rome. We even have our days and our months named after Roman emperors and gods. August, Augustus, Saturday, Saturn. You know, that, the, the influence of Rome still permeates the world today. You know, Rome set the standard for, civilized, for a civilized world. And, and let's, let's not, I mean, we ought, we ought to remember this. Is Rome, what it did is it picked up a lot of the, the culture and traditions of Greece. You know, like you know, Rome and its gods of Jupiter and Saturn, those are just a renaming of the Greek gods. And then we talk about Hellenization and a Hellenized world. See, although Rome was at the helm, they still spoke Greek. Our New Testament is written in Greek. And that was the height of the Roman Empire. So Greek's influence on Rome was very, very heavy. And, and Rome kind of came to its own. But we need to understand as well that Greece... When it was established, it took a lot of the traditions, customs, and culture of Persia. Of Persia. See, when you conquer a nation, you don't just flip the people and flip the cities to conform to you. You integrate it. You take a lot of their good traditions and their good customs and you formulate it into your own new culture after you conquer a nation. And let's not forget that Persia and the great nation that they became was in large part because Babylon was a major influence on Persia. So when you have Rome being an influence to the modern world still today, heavily, I mean, there, there's so many things that you could look at in our system today that's like, man, that's, that's like, that was started in Rome. Rome is just an amalgamation and an integration of the lineage of kingdoms that we've seen beforehand. And essentially, we have the rest of the world from this lineage and this dream that we see. Verse 44. And in the days of those kings. In the days of those kings. See, some commentators would say when, you, when they're saying those kings, that they're talking about those kings of the four kingdoms that we just mentioned. You know, the Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But... I think since there's a focus on the, the toes here, the feet of this image, I think he's talking about the kings of that time, the kings of Rome and its offshoot kingdoms. In the days of those kings, in the days of when Rome is there and when, when Rome divides into ten kingdoms and when those ten kingdoms have its influence on the rest of the world, in the days of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left alone, left to another people. It shall break into pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Amen. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. You see, there's a kingdom that's going to be set up that's going to last. It's not going to be, it's not going to have an end like this image does. It's going to last forever. It's going to become a huge mountain. It's going to crush this image. This kingdom is not going to be handed over to another kingdom like Babylon was to Persia. And like Persia was to Greece and like Greece was to Rome and Rome to ten other kingdoms and those ten kingdoms to other kingdoms. It won't be handed over to another it will stand and it will last forever. And it all comes from a stone. One stone. What is this stone? What is this stone? As we move on, I want to say that although that interpreting this and matching the history with the dream, it can be fascinating to discuss. 
And we could look at all the different interpretations and look at all the different takes on how this works out. And like, this is what I think it is. Well, this is what, where I think it matches up in history. We could do that. And, and it could be fun and great discussion. But I would submit to you guys this morning that the interpretation of that and matching countries to the image, that is not the point of this dream. That is not the point of this passage. What is the stone? Let's talk about that. Secondly, the stone that struck the image and became a great mountain. The stone that breaks into pieces all these kingdoms and brings them to an end. Did you hear that? The stone that breaks down these, this, all these kingdoms, and it brings those kingdoms to an end, like dust, like chaff in the wind. Egypt was known to rule the world at one point, and they fell. The great nation of Israel, with King David, Josiah, Hezekiah, all those great kings, Israel fell. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, those great kingdoms, they fell. The Mongols in Asia, guys like Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan, they fell. Britain, Germany, the USSR, all those great nations, they fell. Every great empire eventually falls. So I want you to consider something this morning. I believe, still, that we live in the greatest nation on the planet. I believe it's the greatest nation in the world. The United States of America is susceptible to this trend. Remember that. And every kingdom that will rise after the United States of America will eventually blow away like chaff in the wind. You know, do, do you know what it means when it talks about like chaff in the wind? I mean, in those days when, when, when they would take their winnowing fork and they wanted to separate all the, all the nasty chaff from the wheat. The wheat would be so heavy that when the fork would go into the chaff, it would, they would kick it up into the air and the wind would carry away the chaff and the wheat would fall. So it was a good separation tool. So it's like the chaff, it'll just blow away. It's not strong. All those kingdoms will fall, but not the kingdom of God. I love the amen. Because we know the kingdom of God will not fall. For as it has been set up during the time of these kings, during the time of the kings of all the nations that I just mentioned. This kingdom has been set up during the time of Donald Trump. This kingdom has been set up during the time of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. This kingdom has been set up all throughout, throughout history. Up until this point, this kingdom has been set up. It's God's kingdom. It will never be destroyed, and it will stand forever. The stone, guys, the stone that was cut from the mountain of God, Mount Zion, if you will, by no human hand, supernaturally, divine, heavenly, as if the Holy Spirit himself cut out the stone. Brothers and sisters, I'm here to declare it to you this morning, today, that Jesus Christ came from heaven, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He is the stone that obliterates the kings and the kingdoms. Amen. He is that stone. Paul states in 1 Corinthians, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Come on. And if you go to Ephesians, he elaborates there that Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone of that foundation. It is Jesus Christ that is the stone. Paul goes on to declare that the rock, the rock that followed God's people in the wilderness with spiritual drink, that rock is Christ. Amen. That rock is Christ. And it gave them water to survive and live. Oh, guys, I call you this morning, drink of the living water of Christ and you will never go thirsty again. You'll never go thirsty again. And it was after Peter 
It was after Peter had made the confession. You are the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. It was after he made that confession when Jesus triumphantly declared, I will build my church on that rock. We just got done talking about how Jesus is the rock. We looked at so many Old Testament scriptures talking about how God is the rock. Where, does, where do the people constantly dig their head and put their, put their sights towards Rome and say that this rock is somebody else or something else? Come on. Let's look at the entirety of scripture and see that God has always been the rock of ages. There is no other rock. You can't tell me that some man cooped up in a mansion in Rome right now is going to crush all the nations. It is Jesus Christ that crushes these nations, not Peter. Turn your heads from the fallacy of Rome. Don't look there. It's none other than the rock of ages, the rock of salvation, the rock of refuge, the stone of offense, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. He is the rock. My hope is built on nothing less, guys. Because it's on Christ, the solid rock I stand. Christ is the solid rock that I stand on. Nothing can withstand his impact. Nothing can withstand his impact and the force that turns all other kingdoms to dust. I'm good, bro. Don't worry about it. Come on. Got to channel the inner Spurgeon this morning. You all right with that? Oh, let's go. Listen, guys, nothing, nothing can withstand the impact of Christ and the force that turns all other kingdoms to dust. Likewise, nothing will prevent the growth of his kingdom. Nothing will prevent the growth of his kingdom. I don't care who is put in office. They are not going to thwart the growth of the kingdom of heaven. When it's all said and done, it will be a mighty mountain that fills the entire earth. And when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that that beautiful passage of scripture that talks about the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection. And, and it talks about the, the eschatology, the, 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 the last times when, when Christ is going to conquer everything. You see that in verse 24 and t- through 26, it says, then comes the end. Then comes the end. How many are waiting for the end? I'm waiting for all this to be done too. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, The the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Folks, we just saw an image here. We just saw a dream of where the rock, Jesus Christ, is destroying the nations. And then we see Paul here saying that in the end, he will deliver the kingdom to God the Father. After he has destroyed every rule, after he's destroyed every authority, destroying every power. But he is reigning right now. He must reign until he has put all those enemies under his feet. Don't tell me that Jesus isn't reigning right now. Don't tell me that he's not in control right now. Look, some of us might think, oh my gosh, oh, or oh, our gosh, Uh, God has lost control. God has lost control. No, God, he hasn't lost control. He is reigning right now, and he is putting all his enemies under his feet. And that last enemy, the last enemy is death. As people still die today. But in the end, we don't experience that. Christ will defeat death. He's already conquered death, and it's yet to be defeated and to be thrown into the lake of fire with the dragon and the beast and all those who don't call upon the name of Jesus. That's why we declare with Paul when he writes to Timothy, 
he who is the blessed and sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Where are presidents? Where are dictators? Where are rulers? When you consider the sovereignty and the reign of God, where are they? How significant really are they? When God is king of this world. Listen, guys, he's orchestrating everything. Everything. Sometimes it doesn't go our way. Sometimes it goes our way. But whether or not you're for or against a certain king rising up, a certain president rising up, you must understand that there's been somebody sitting on a throne. And he's still sitting on the throne. And he will be on that throne. Our king isn't elected. Our king is not elected. As a matter of fact, he elects. Before the foundation of the world, he is the one who's elected you. Guys, our king doesn't sit in a white house. Our king sits on the great white throne in heaven. Amen. Guys, our king doesn't need a judge to save him. Our king is the judge. Amen. And he will save. That is the king that we serve. And that is the kingdom we belong to. May the world, the whole world recognize his reign. And they will. They will. Philippians chapter 2, it says, At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the kingdom that you belong to. We serve a king that everybody's going to bow to, regardless of how they feel about him. Some say they don't believe in him. Some say that he's evil. Some say that he should be better. Not on the day of judgment. Not on the day of judgment. They won't say those words. Neither did King Nebuchadnezzar when he recognized the Lord and what he was doing. Lastly, the king recognizes the Lord. The king gets, ends up recognizing the Lord here. Verse 45, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Verse 46, the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court. Lord willing, next week, we'll consider Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the king realized here. The king realized that although the image was mighty, although that image was mighty, it crumbled to dust and it blew away like chaff. You know, I get this. I can't help but just have this thought of it blowing away as though, as though Jesus had like an infinity gauntlet. Right? And he snapped his fingers. And just dust blew away and disappeared and you couldn't see it anymore. That's an Avengers reference if you don't know. But, but that's how it blows away. Like chaff. Like, like, like you can't even see it anymore. And although the image was of exceeding brightness, and it could be seen as far as the eye could see, God inhabits unapproachable light. And nobody has seen him, although his light is so bright. 
although the image was frightening. Nebuchadnezzar realized that he must fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Matthew 10, 28. Nebuchadnezzar falling before Daniel. It was not in worship of Daniel. It was in reverence to his God. It was in reverent fear of the one who created Daniel and who gave Daniel the dream and its interpretation. You know, we, we may all, some of us know some of these people. Some of these people who pro profess to believe in God. Folks who have somewhat of a reverent fear of God. We know some of these people. These are the ones that Christianize their talk, but then Satanize their walk. You know, these are the ones that are attracted to the world, but or attracted to the word, rather, but they never commit. They look at the words of God, they look at the promises of God, and they say, oh, I want to be a part of that. But they don't do what's necessary. They don't repent and have faith. They don't commit. These are the ones that are ready to respect and ready to defend your faith. But they're too weak and too comfortable to give up the sin that they set in themselves. We know some of these. Listen, I'm not naive to think that one of you might be sitting here today. I'm not naive to, to, believe that, to not believe that somebody watching this stream is one of those people that says, you know what, I like God. I like the idea, but you know what, that's just not my thing. You know, I'm all for you. Oh yeah, God is in control. Amen, brother. They like your Jesus is King posts and stuff like that. Yeah, I realize that some are out there like that, that are hearing this right now. And to them, I would say that I appeal to you to like Nebuchadnezzar, don't meet Christ and reject him. Don't see the work of God and reject it. Don't experience the word of God and reject it. Don't. Repent of your sin. Put your faith in Jesus Christ this morning. That is the call for you today. Peter says in his first epistle that Jesus is the living stone. The living stone rejected by men. But in the sight of God is chosen and precious. And then Peter goes on to say that whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus Christ, we will not be put to shame. Amen? Amen. That is our king. That is our God. And we appeal to those who haven't put their faith and trust in Jesus to do that today. Repent. Repent of your ways. Repent of your sin. Because you have fallen short. We all have fallen short. Come to Christ. Come, as, come to Christ and sing with us. Just sing, sing with us like we sang this morning. There's nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Listen, it, leave it all behind. Take nothing with you. I mean, if you're like Nebuchadnezzar and you have a crown, you have power, prestige, money, Leave it all behind. Don't take nothing to the cross. Because if you have something in your hand, you can't cling to it. You cannot grab hold of it. And if you don't grab hold of it, you won't see. John the Baptist declared, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff, there's that chaff again, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. You remember that God is judge. God is judge, and he will judge righteously. Sing with the saints, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself from thee. We need to tuck ourselves in the crevice of Christ. Because outside of him, we are in danger. We will die. 
doctrine again. The kings and kingdoms of the earth are subject to Christ and his kingdom. Such a timely message, wouldn't you agree? How wonderful and magnificent the Lord works in the timing of his messages to his people. Again, we didn't, we didn't plan this. We didn't foresee this. I look at the passage every week, and the Holy Spirit tells me where to start and where to stop. Clearly. But in conclusion, maybe you can relate to Nebuchadnezzar this morning. As you ask, what is the Lord doing in all this? What is going on in America with our election and the world? What is happening? And as Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is doing exactly what we've known him to do throughout biblical history and the history of the church. He hasn't changed. We've seen God call fallen men and women to sanctify them and perform his progressive work in redemption. We've seen God raise up and tear down thousands of kings for their advancement or the judgment of the people. We've seen the gates of hell unsuccessfully not be able to prevail against the church and the kingdom of God grow larger and larger as a result. For us who belong to Christ, like Daniel, we will not be fearful in the king's court, nor in his secular empire. We don't fear from one king to the next president. Like Daniel, we build our houses. We live in a culture that is okay with the slaughtering of the unborn, that is blatantly rebellious to the created order in marriage, and continually creates laws to push God further and further away and become more hostile to his people. We live in that world, but we're not of it. And we're sure as heck not fearful of it. We don't fear this because we know that although we are in this world, we're not of it, the kingdom will be crushed one day, the stone of God. One day the stone of God will crush everything. Crush it all. So what is God doing, you ask? God is faithfully executing his plan of redemption to glorify his name in all the earth to one day culminate on this very revelation. Are you ready? And I'll leave you with this. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and he will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. That is your promise, saint. And that is mine. And I will cling to that. Heavenly Father, Sometimes life just seems so uncertain. And that's only because we don't live in the future as you live. We can't see the beginning from the end, but you can. Lord, not only can you see the end, you've, you've constructed the end. 
you will make the finish. You will culminate it exactly as you've said. And we cling to that promise this morning. Regardless of what's going on in our lives, whether it's the political sphere, whether it's personal, whether it's cultural, whether it's with our education, our families, whatever it is, Lord, you are in control. You are on the throne, and that's all that matters. So God, I ask that I, on behalf of everybody here, would be strengthened by your word, would be strengthened to move forward and know that there's nothing that will remove you from your throne. Amen. We worship you this day, mighty God. It's in the name of Jesus, King Jesus, that we all say this prayer. Amen. Amen.